hold it or? It's done. Today is Wednesday, December 12th, 2007. I am H.F. Williamson. I'm interviewing Perry Rannebarger for the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress, American Folk Life Center. We are at Studio X in Campbell Hall on the campus in Urbana, Illinois. Jack Mark is the Director of Lighting, Sound, and Camera. Okay. I'd like you to start by telling me where you were prior to going into service and what you were doing and how you came to be drafted. I was uh, living with my folks in uh, Saybrook, Illinois and uh, doing a farm there. And I got, we bought uh, a tractor and rented some more land when I graduated from high school. And uh, I farmed about two or three years, I, something like that. And as far as the draft goes, I've got a few thoughts about that, but it's all over now, so what the heck. But uh, I got, it seems as though they started evidently to do it alphabetically because I had two uh, guys there with me at the same time and one of them's name was Bruce and the other's name was Baker. And then for some unknown reason, they skipped to Rannemarger. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, you know, I thought, oh, they want to get rid of me. And they tried, but they couldn't make it. Well, I'm glad. How's that? So you were, which as branch I, was? I went the whole course and uh, got back home again. Well, let's talk about that whole course in our interview today. Yeah. Which branch were you drafted into? Which what? Which branch of the service were you drafted into? I was in the infantry. I was a rifleman. This was with the Illinois National Guard? As Illinois National Guard, yes. They got, we went to uh, Chicago, and there's where I was sworn in. From there, I went to Camp Grant. Where was that located? Around uh, Rockford, Illinois, up there by Rockford. That's right, it isn't there anymore, is it? I don't think so. No, it isn't. So and that's, where, that's where basic training occurred? No. We went to uh, Camp Forest, Tennessee for a basic training. And uh, that's over there between Nashville and Chattanooga. I don't know whether it's there anymore or not either. Oh, I'm not no. sure. But uh, anyhow, it's the uh, way down. I went to, uh, that's where the, it all happened, the basic training. and. Thank God for that, because um, it all happened early enough in the game that uh, I got my full basic training and we got the summer spent on maneuvers in uh, Arkansas and Louisiana. And that was a lot of help, I found out, after it was all over. But uh, I'm sure glad I got it. Were some of the troops that you you served with later not able to have such a long basic training? Oh, yes. Yes, a lot of the guys were really green when we got them. But they was, yeah, we, we set to, uh, had to have replacements because uh, a lot of the people that started out with me are gone. They either got sick or uh, got shot, one or the other. Well, we'll talk about that as we go through your experiences on the Pacific Theater. Yeah. So you, had, uh, you were able to take the basic training and then the maneuvers that you mentioned yes. in Arkansas and Louisiana. Uh -huh. What was the next step? The next step was uh, we went back. Uh, by the way, I don't know whether it has any bearing on it or not, but the, I was in the 131st Regiment of the uh, Illinois National Guard, but they all the uh, non-coms that uh, gave me the training were out of Chicago, and uh, 
after I got that done, and we, after we had the maneuvers, and then we were out playing around on a weekend pass, and what happened? The Japs bombed Pearl Harbor. So we didn't know what to do. I thought maybe, maybe we'd better get back to camp. So we okay. went back, and uh, we were then transferred to 132nd Regiment. And uh, they, what they were doing, they were getting a task force ready to go to the Pacific. We didn't know it at first, what what was going on, but we just figured, you know, they're getting rid of some of their chaff, it is. and and uh, that's about the them. They transferred uh, oh, some of us over to the 132nd, and the uh, next thing we know, we're bound for New York City, and the. Uh, got on the ship there, which was uh, Santa Rosa, uh, 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 luxury liner for the Cunard line, and uh, they had changed it over to a troop ship. Well, yeah, it, was a, it was a nice ride. What was the destination? Yeah. Our destination? Well, we didn't know what <laughs> where we got our destination. Right. We went through the Panama Canal, and then we began to put two and two together. And it does. Our destination must be in the Pacific, because uh, the Japs were over there in the meantime while we were doing this. They were taking island after island. They were moving in here and there, and we didn't know where they were going to move next, but we knew where we were going. We got, finally, Australia was our port. We were headed for, and in about 30 days, we got there. We zigzagged across the ocean all the way, and oh, we had uh, one submarine scare, I think was about all. And that was very interesting, too, to see those destroyers go into action. It was really beautiful. That they, they, got, they sank the sub all right. Oh, we wonderful. never saw it, but they did. <laughs> and uh, so we went on then over. We got to Melbourne. So you basically went directly from New York yes. to Melbourne with just a few stops to Right. To get fuel or whatever. Wow. So, they, um, we no more than got there till the Japs started flying over, and uh, they decided we better get these guys off and get these ships out of here. So, what they did was uh, unload us and put us in a park overnight. We spent the night there, but the Japs never did bother us again. I don't know what they were doing, what they were up to, but they didn't bother us any. And uh, next day we got on the train and we went to Ballarat. And there's where we got in the uh, home of these people. And it's, uh, the, the entire uh, regiment it, was being housed? Well, yeah, the entire, whoever was on the ship, it was a whole regiment, yeah, that's 132nd. And uh, they would, uh, we were then known, they said, as Task Force 6814. And that was, uh, took us all over the place, didn't it? But we had, uh, all kinds of generals, this is there is the generals, and some of them weren't even generals. They were colonels, and it was all, you know, helder skelter because we weren't prepared for this anyway. This was a, a rush job they did on us to get, to get us over there because they, the Japs were taken here and there, and uh, we wanted to get them stopped. So we went uh, back to where we went to, Ballarat. We went over there, 
just to get out away from the port because they figured that the back Japs might come down and bomb port like they did uh, Pearl Harbor. Right. But they never did it. But we stayed about two weeks, I think, it was something like that in Ballarat. And uh, we dra trained uh, you know, for this and that and the other thing, anything to keep us busy in the park. And at uh, night, we'd go and uh, live with the family. And that was before they did. The family were very nice people. And uh, to my surprise, they lived about like we did, very much the same. As the uh, father was a man who had been wounded in the Boer War, and he lived on a pension. And his wife and uh, a 14-year-old daughter. And that's uh, well, they took us in, and we talked, and we talked, and then we had a wonderful time there. They were really nice. Okay. So then we got back on the ship again and went to New Caledonia. In uh, New Caledonia, they thought maybe that they would show up over there, but they, uh, they didn't. They, they, they got busy with uh, the, uh, well, I have to get ahead of myself here. Uh, we were in Caledonia about a year, and we dug foxholes, and we guarding a place, every port or everything that even looked like a port. Uh, we were around there guarding, and uh, in case they did come. And then we had the, uh, the Navy had uh, the Coral Sea battle, which everybody I think is more or less familiar with. And that battle determined who was going to have supremacy over the South Pacific area. And it was us. We, we won it. We took a, a terrible beating, but they won it. The Navy did their job there. And uh, after that, then things began to open up. Now, meanwhile, uh, there were Marines in uh, Guadalcanal, and they uh, were just more or less isolated. They were kind of living on their own. We could, shipping was no place, and uh, it was really tough for them. I thought, you know, that, uh, well, I, I didn't have a feeling on how those guys must have felt. They had no support whatsoever. They were in there at Guadalcanal at Fenderson Field, and they were getting bombed out, and they had Japs already on the island before they even got there. And uh, the, um, got started moving our uh, outfit then. So you, if I could just ask, so you had a year of training in New Caledonia. That must have been very helpful to have such a long time to get prepared. Well, not really. I, I don't, uh, we didn't do much. We, uh, we just stood guard <laughs> and <laughs> fed the mosquitoes. <laughs> oh, man. Was that was a terrible play. Were there but, any troops, such as the local Australian troops, who'd had experience fighting on the islands that could help you get a feel for what was going to go on? Or? Uh, they had uh, some natives there, Nat natives that did uh, odd work, odd jobs. And they helped us out quite a bit. And they were friendly. They were, uh, New Caledonia is a French island. And they speak English, spoke English and everything else. And hey, it was, it was uh, kind of, you know, like a vacation being there even. And uh, was after the year there in, in the Coral Sea battle, well, then things began to move. 
and uh, we were loaded on the ship again, and we headed for Guadalcanal. And uh, our task there was clean them all off of the island, get them all. That was what our task was. And uh, we uh, landed the, down there by uh, Henderson Field where the Marines were. And uh, after we got situated, the Marines all took off. And <laughs> they sure deserved it. They, they deserved to be relieved. And uh, we had uh, then, mostly it was up to us. So we had, uh, well, there was just more than our regiment. They, could, they called it the 2nd Battalion, whatever that means, I don't really know. But uh, we're the ones that were assigned the job of doing that. And we started out by taking Hill 27. That was uh, known as Mount Austin. It was in the Mount Austin area. And that was very important because that was our first step. And we, we learned there a little bit about it. battle. And I got a battle star from there. Now at this time, are you an infantryman, or what weapon are you assigned to? What do I, are you what? carrying a rifle, or are you with a machine? Yes, I'm yeah. still a rifleman. So you're an infantry yeah, a rifleman. I'm still a rifleman. And uh, that's, uh, we were the uh, lead, uh, the, the, uh, we went around behind the hill and went up from the back side so the Japs couldn't tell what we were doing because they had a, a group of them down there but below that hill. Let's see, there were several hills there, but they were down in there and that was their main camp area where the biggest part of them were. Uh, we went around behind that hill and went up in single file. It was so through the jungle. Single file was the only way we could go. Our company was in the lead. And uh, we got up on the hill all right, but they had snipers posted around there. The snipers started in on us, and they got uh, one here and there. And uh, after that, they, the guys down below, the Japs down below, they got word of what was going on. So they started sending up waves of men to get us out of there. They, they didn't want us on that hill. It was a strategic position. And uh, after, uh, well, this all happened in one day. It seemed like it was forever, but it, it all happened one day. They sent up several waves, and I fired all my uh, ammunition practically and uh, threw all my grenades, but we held the hill. That was an important thing we did. And uh, we took some losses on that maneuver, too. That was the uh, worst part of it. I could tell yeah, you, you, you can't get much worse than that, I don't think. I can understand. Unless you would have to go to Iraq. I think that's the, that's the worst thing that ever happened. That, that was terrible, that the Iraq thing. I, I feel sorry for those guys that had to live through that. I can understand but, that, too. Compared so, to, returning so, to the hill, so you, you maintained control of the hill and were reinforced? or Yeah, we maintained the, the, the hill. And uh, then uh, they had other forces there that they had moved in, too. They moved them in. We didn't know about them. We, we thought we were the only ones there, but we weren't. So they engaged the uh, gaps and, and uh, kept them busy. And 
the, one of the most important things, and I still don't understand how it happened, but uh, they were sending up all these waves, and finally they began to kind of uh, peter out. They didn't have uh, enough men to, to do it anymore, but they were under a thing about as bad as we were, or even worse, I think, because they were sent up there with the opinion that they were taking the hill back or they would die. They were never going to give up. And we had very few prisoners taken there. And uh, as a matter of fact, I don't think we had any taken on that maneuver, as far as I'm concerned. And so. These other regiments, there, there was uh, there was two of them over there. One of them was from North Dakota, and the other one was from uh, oh, I just think that maybe where it was from. But they were regular army, and uh, they were pretty good, and they. Uh, my opinion is that the uh, generals that were doing the uh, plotting the maneuvers were the uh, regular army too, most of them were, and, and they, they figured that, uh, well, those guys don't, they're the National Guard, they don't know how to fight. So they made those other guys do most of the thing. <laughs> and, uh, that was another advantage I had that I didn't know about at then. So this went on and uh, for a, a while, and we did uh, maneuvers, and or not maneuvers, we did uh, scouting. We went, we made scouting parties. We went went out uh, so about every day. Uh, after I did, I, I found out that uh, they needed a radio man, and I was kind of a nut for radio. You sent in radio, and I'd be there, so I'd well, I'll volunteer, you know, and go ahead and take the radio on the maneuvers. And uh, what happened was that it dawned on me. Shortly after that, that, I was going out with other companies, you know. I said, hey, hey, this is double jeopardy. I can't do this. And I don't know how I got out, out of it or whether the sergeant, my sergeant, he may have gotten me out of it. But anyhow, I got out of it. And I didn't run the radio anymore. So when you went out on a scouting party, what were you, how far ahead of the lines were you going? We were just going out to their information and right. find out what was going on uh, with the Japanese and or how you get here or how you get there or things like that. And uh, we had an interesting thing happen there. Was one party we went way the the Japs were all the way around the uh, coast, you know that they. They didn't go back in. I don't know why they didn't, but they didn't. And uh, we went back in on a scouting party, and uh, we found out what it was. The, all the natives were back. They, they all went back into the interior, in the jungle, deep jungle. And we went back through there and uh, ran across the machines, and oh, they were glad to see us, and they climbed up. The, trees and knock down coconuts and chop the ends off and say, have a drink. <laughs> that, that, uh, that, uh, we, we had some natives there that uh, the other outfits, I mean, must have had them and they, uh, we didn't know about them. That was the one thing that I don't understand how it happened, but it seemed like we knew very little and we thought that we were the only ones there. That gave the feeling we had. But uh, 
there were others there too. Like I said, these other other two regiments were there from regular army, and uh, we had one uh, marine uh, regiment they sent in after the Cor Sea battle. They sent they sent in a new marine regiment, and they used them to help on the coast get the Japs taken care of, and. We had pretty things pretty well on the hand, and uh, they decided, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take some guys and run them around on the water and land them up there by Lunga Point. And uh, so I was one of the guys that got to take that trip. And you think about being scared, I don't know. I wasn't scared. I, you get beyond scared. You, just, you get to where you're kind of numb. You just do what you have to do and that's it. Mm -hmm. At, uh, we were on this landing boat and uh, it was just full of all we could put on. There were several of us that did it too. They had several boats there and uh, we went around, but on the way around, there was a Jap plane come over. And, uh, boy, you, you know, you feel like, well, if he wanted to strafe us, he could do it. He could have done anything he wanted to, but he didn't. He was just out looking for information, I guess, is what it was, because he didn't, uh, didn't attack us. And we got up to Longwood uh, Point, and they said, well, you can't land here. There's too many Japs there. So we went around a little farther, and then we landed. And that's where the uh, thing came about, was uh, we were going to put a pincers on them. They were, the other outfits were coming up from the front side, and we were coming around from the back side, and we were going to, and your backside, you know, and uh, those maneuvers is always your weak side, it seemed like. It was always, you, you can't cover it very well because it takes all the men you got in the front to take care of things up there. And uh, so we got up there and got landed and everything. And got, we walked uh, all day. We got up on a hill. Uh, top of the hill there, and that was where we were supposed to be. We, we got there on time and everything, and uh, come dark, the, uh, we thought artillery started to cover us by firing it volleys over, and uh, it was landing so close that uh, we were afraid that they were going to wipe us out, but then nobody ever got hit. It, it wasn't as close as we thought it was, I guess. But they, they were, they did their job very well. And uh, right then, I was trying to get a hold of somebody on the radio and couldn't get anybody, nobody on that. Those those radios were strange. They was kind of like CB radios. They got. Uh, not very, they had a limited uh, distance that they would travel, and we were too far out. We couldn't, we couldn't contact anybody again. So anyway, uh, that may have been how my radio experience on it. I, I didn't have it anymore after that. But uh, there wasn't any need for it anymore after that because um, that night, the uh, started to evacuate the Japanese down below. And they got, I think it was, oh, like 1,800 of them out of there or something. They, they really cleaned the place up pretty well. And we went down the next morning and there was nothing left there but sick and uh, dead people. And he, Dead Japs. I mean, as we didn't we didn't have a battle there at all. It, it, unfortunately, 
That was another lucky break I had. It seemed like I'd been taken care of pretty well somehow, because mm -hmm. I had two lucky breaks. And uh, that we did, it, they met up with the other outfit, and that was the end of the war on Guadalcanal. It was all over. They so by, at that time, the island was secured? Yes. Okay. The island was secure. How many days had you been on the island? Probably. What? How long had you been on the island, approximately? Oh, I don't know. It, uh, it started, this happened, uh, I think, uh, let me be thinking. Oh, we've been there six months, I think, or something like that. That's probably about what it was, oh. about six months. And uh, they kept us busy most of the time. But we, uh, uh, our mission was accomplished as far as that was concerned. But then, but, uh, that also uh, cleared things out there. So uh, in the meantime, the Japs were having trouble with their other islands, their people on their other islands around there. They, they were getting a little low on troops themselves, and their uh, uh, supplies were very limited because they didn't uh, have a, a Navy supremacy anymore over the seas. It was ours, you know, after that battle, it was ours, well, ours. And uh, we could uh, get along pretty good. Yeah. I, I thought that they had submarines out there, but I don't know for sure. I never saw any, or I never heard any more about it. But anyhow, uh, that was the, the end of it as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Uh, so they sent us back to Fiji Island for rest and rehabilitation. And uh, while I was there, I came down with malaria. And uh, that was another <laughs> lucky break for me. As a matter of fact, I think it probably saved my life because Afterwards, I found out. I didn't. I didn't know then what was going on. But afterwards, I, I uh, uh, my son got a, a couple of books for me, and one of them was a book. I don't know who wrote it, but the, it was Orchids in the Mud. Uh, people have uh, evidently. He he worked for the university, and he found out where he could get a hold of stuff like that. And uh, another one was uh, the uh, Under the Southern Cross. And that's how uh, we got our name eventually. They called it America Elevation. And they had uh, Southern Cross for a shoulder, big old shoulder patch. Oh, I never wore that, I don't know. But they sent me back. Uh, with uh, malaria and uh, to Fiji, and they decided while I was there, I just as well sent him back home. We'd been over here too long, I guess, or something. So they transferred me to a field artillery outfit, and I never had anything to do with them. I just rode back to uh, San Francisco. I had to do guard duty on a bunch of nuts. That were, uh, they were our own people, but they were guys that were uh, out of the guard house. They were sending them home too. So they had it, they had it made too, as well as I did. Now, I got back uh, to San Francisco and I just went home on uh, I had, uh, oh, I think it was two weeks for a little. It was pretty nice. And uh, after that was over, I went to uh, Fort Bliss, 
Texas, and El Paso, Texas. And that turned out to be a pretty nice thing, too. Because I was office boy for uh, a civilian who ran the uh, medium maintenance uh, on trucks shop. He ran the medium maintenance shops. And he says, yeah, I can use an office boy. I'll take him. And that, uh, that was uh, nice because he was a civilian and he never told me to do anything. He asked me, he said, would you like to do this or will you do this? He was a wonderful person. Uh, he was an Irishman and <laughs> it cuts the Mexicans up the line and down the other. You know, they had a lot of Mexicans working there in the shop. And, but this was on he, he, was, he was, you thought, oh, he's a rough guy, you know, but he was a real nice guy. It, yeah, outside of that, his uh, experience with the Mexicans, he did. Uh, he knew you had to do. They start playing. It, it, you didn't keep right on them. They, they start playing around. They, those darn guys, they, they didn't care, you know. Now, this was on Fort Bliss? At this yeah, time? this was on Fort you Bliss. You were in the motor pool? Or the, yeah. Well, I was there six months. And uh, about, I think it was about six months. And uh, next thing I know, we're assembling a bunch of guys to go to France. And I'm in it, and I thought, oh, I don't want to go to France. Why would I want to go to France? There, there was no uh, real danger involved because uh, the Battle of the Bulge was a very important battle over there, and the Germans almost broke out. And they took everything that they had, every man they could get up there to the front in order to contain them. And they did, they got them contained. And they sent us over to replace these guys. And that's how I got to go to France. So this was in 19, 1944, 1945, right towards the end of 19, yeah. Yeah, that was about 1945. Because I came home from there, went right to uh, a camp in uh, Wisconsin, Camp McCoy, Wisconsin, and uh, was discharged. It was, uh, I had well, how a, long were you in France? How long? Quite a I don't know. I probably, uh, oh. Four, four months, I guess, something okay. like that. I got a, I got out in uh, October of 1945. That's when I got out. And uh, so, were you in France when the war ended? In yeah, I was in France when both wars ended. That's exciting. And everybody was dancing on the street. I'll tell you, they were happy over there in France. <laughs> and uh, that was a great thing. That, 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 um, Earlier, you mentioned that in the books that you had been, that your son found, you found out what happened to the Americal Division after you left with malaria. Did you? Oh yes, right, they went all the way to Japan, Bougainville, and uh, I don't know what else. But Bougainville was their biggest battle after that. And they got pretty well wiped out. And they got replacements, of course. And uh, they went on and they did uh, some guard duty and all that, what do they call it? Uh, occupation? Occupation forces in Japan. Yeah, well, what happened after that, I don't know. But as far as you could tell, many that, of the the men that you served with on Guadalcanal may have gone through some of the worst battles in the rest yes. of the Pacific. Yes, we had to, some of them did it. And uh, they uh, wound up over there. But uh, I, I've been over there three years in the island. 
And they figured that was long enough because they, they gave us numbers somehow. I don't know what they based it on. But yes, I had a top number. I was, I was bound. And believe it or not, when my number came up, I went. That's what they did. There wasn't any argument about it. And I was ready to go. I was ready to go somewhere. I didn't care where I went. I didn't. I wasn't uh, homesick or anything like that. I just so I went back to Saybrook and uh, I married this girl and uh, we was going to start having a family because my uh, aunts and uncles that didn't have any children has pointed a finger at me and said, "You're going to have to carry the name on." <laughs> so <laughs> that, that's how that happened. Now I said, well, I said, get on with it. And uh, we, uh, uh, we well, couldn't, couldn't live with the folks anymore. The place was too small for some reason or another. So we moved out. And uh, I got a job at uh, Chevrolet Garage in uh, Rantoul. And uh, Worked there four years, and uh, <coughs> I got uh, left there. Went to came here to Champaign, and uh, I worked at Sullivan Chevrolet in Champaign for four more years. Well, in the meantime, I got the feeling this was not for me being a mechanic. I did it. I started out and I did, did, did the whole business over all the car completely and uh, and uh, I said, yeah, I don't want any more of this. So I took a home study course in television and uh, went to work at the, the television shop here in, Ch here in Champaign and worked there for 22 years. It was a timely time, good time to start in television, right at that period, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's when I started. Uh, I was radio, I started in radio. Right. And, uh, uh, and I, I guess uh, they, television started coming in and we sold, oh, they sold televisions of all kinds there. Really sold them. And uh, we had a, uh, Klaus in the bureau was our uh, out uh, wholesale supplier, and uh, he did something the boss didn't like, so we changed, and uh, they started selling Zenith then, and uh, we sold Zenith. We sold a lot of them. Boy, they were they were the best then, and uh, that's back to. Uh, where my story was that uh, I worked 22 years in the, as a television repairman. And uh, then I sensed that the boss was going to want to retire. He was a little older than I was, and he didn't. Uh, he was getting ready to retire. He'd had enough of it too, and uh, so I shopped around and got the job working with Sears and Roebuck. I said, "See, it out here at the mall, you know, they were just uh, that mall was pretty new then." And I thought, yeah, "That'd be a nice place to work." And I went over there and uh, I got a job there, and I worked there for seven years. Well, I was ready to retire then. I, re I retired a year early, and now here I am. I get to 20 years of retirement, and the time is going so fast, I could probably put in 20 more yeah, so. if nothing happens. That's about the sign. That's it. Well, I was thinking about the fact that your aunts and uncles had that high expectation. I'm glad that you were so lucky, so so often. 
Yeah. Any other thoughts about those years in the service when you think back to that period that you might want to share with us? Oh, we went to Missouri. We got, uh, I, got I retired here. I, I, we went to Missouri. And I decided that I probably where I wanted to go. So we made a couple of trips down there to scout the place out, you know, and uh, well, I, I decided where I wanted to go. I marked the place on the map. And I said, it's in that area somewhere. And we went down and scouted that out, and it just did look pretty good. We made uh, right away uh, arrangements to go uh, down there. I bought an old used truck, and uh, uh, <coughs> we was loaded up and moved on down. And the boys helped me uh, get moved and everything. And then we spent. Uh, uh, fifteen or sixteen years down there in retirement, and we had some wonderful friends down there too. Not a lot of them, but we had a lot. Of, had some that were really nice, and uh, when uh, I had a stroke in uh, October in 1997, and. Uh, that put me out of business for a little bit, and I decided that uh, we better get back to Illinois. That's yeah, good old Illinois. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> we uh, boys came down again, and loaded us up, and hauled us back, and again. I decided to come champagne for me. I worked here longer than any place I ever place I'd been, any other place I'd been, and uh, I thought that you know it, I, I would just kind of adopt this for my my hometown if they'll have me, and I guess they'll have me. I haven't had any uh, objections to it anyway. So. I'm sure, your family is. They live here. Are glad you moved back. As well. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's been a wonderful place. Yeah, influence the university and everything. Up there. Well, I want to thank Nothing. you for sharing your experiences with us. And yeah, is Nothing. there any other experience from your time in the army or on the islands that you have <laughs> thought of that you might want to mention or comment on? No, I think that's about all there is to it. And we had the Harry trip. That that Harry trip we had from New York to Melbourne, Australia. First time I'd ever been on the water, and uh, probably will be the last. <laughs> <coughs> but it was it was real nice. Did you wonder why they had sent you to New York? in order to go to the Pacific Theater and not sent you to San Francisco first. Uh, that sounds kind of uh, going the wrong way. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. Well, you got to see the Panama Canal as a result of that. Yeah. That, that was nice. We did. It was nice. Yeah. We stopped there and took on water. And uh, we got to... Uh, we didn't get off the ship, but we got to see the whole thing, the locks and everything. It's unbelievable, those locks. Yeah. Well, again, I'd like to thank you and your wife for joining us today for this interview. I've been fascinated to hear your story, and I'm so pleased that you were lucky and probably as skillful as you were and came back. Thank you. I think we're done. Okay. Thank you.